everybody. Um, welcome everybody to, this is actually um, our fifth event of the year, um, despite it only being March. Um, so welcome to all of you um, who've come to hear um, Tom talking about Edward the Master. Um, very pleased to um, welcome lots of our usual Zoomers this evening, but we also have quite a few people that Tom has invited who he knows through sort of different organisations in Winchester. So a big welcome to everybody who hasn't joined us for a friend's talk um, before. Um, lots of you know the drill, but just to say that um, after I go through the introductions, I'll pass over to Bruce Parker, who will do a few brief introductions, and then we'll be on to Tom's presentation. At the end, there will be a chance to answer, ask questions. Um, you can either send questions in through the chat um, or you can drop me an email or you can unmute yourself at the end and, and ask a question directly. If there's anything you think about afterwards um, that you want to know, please drop me an email and Tom will be very happy to um, get in touch with you and answer the question. If you could all, um, I have all muted you all, but if you could just try and stay muted during the, the talk, I'd be very grateful. Um, just final thing from me, just wanted to say that um, uh, we're very pleased that we, I applied for a grant from Winchester City Council. It was their um, small, um, their, their town forum grant scheme, which is for organisations to um, uh, buy small amounts of things. And so we've been awarded a grant um, of £500 to um, fund our Zoom costs. Um, as you, probably, some of you probably know, we we went for the um, expensive options at the beginning of the year so we could have more than 100 people. So we're really pleased that Winchester City Council are helping fund that. Um, although, don't stop the donations coming. Um, Anyway, I think that's all from me, and I will pass over to Bruce. Hello, thanks, uh, thanks, Lucy. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening to you. Thanks uh, very much for joining us. Um, funnily enough, I've been checking with other cathedrals around the country to see what sort of things they're doing, and I'm happy to say that I think we're doing far more events than any other. In fact, I know this. Any other cathedral I've, I've looked at or talked to or whatever, um, we are putting on more events. So I'm really, really, really proud of that. Um, so to Tom, anyway, Tom Watson is vice chairman um, of the trustees uh, and a very great support uh, to me, I have to say, uh, very steeped in uh, cathedral life and Jenny's wife is a bell ringer as well. Uh, Tom uh, is a retired, I think he's retired, oh, you are Tom, aren't you? A professor of media studies. Um, he's also an eminent historian. Uh, so I um, can't say any more than that really, except I think Tom, uh, Tom was actually the last person to do a real lecture for the Friends uh, all those many months ago, just about um, a year ago or over a year ago uh, in the Paul Woodhouse suite. So enough from me, looking forward very much Tom to hearing from you, um, Edward, King and Martha. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Thank you and um, good evening everyone. Um, Great that so many of you have come, and, and thanks to my friends for, for uh, having a, a try of a, a Zoom talk from the friends. I hope you all like murder mysteries. Uh, my talk this evening is about Edward, Edward, King of the West Saxons, who is a martyr saint. It's a tale of an exceptional but largely forgotten English saint, and his short life and violent death were called an Anglo-Saxon murder mystery by Professor Barbara York, the University of Winchester's leading Anglo-Saxon historian in a book chapter that she published about 20 years ago. Now it's not quite Midsummer Murders or my favorite Inspector Montalbano, but there is a murder, an allegedly wicked stepmother, miracles, and the commemoration of an English saint that continues until this very day. We've lost, uh... So today is March the 18th. It's also the feast day of Edward King. Uh, it's the feast day of Edward King of the West Saxons, who died 1,043 years ago. And you can see this in this image of the calendar of the Book of Common Prayer. This festival has been in the Book of Common Prayer's calendar since the third edition of 1559 and is still in the most recent edition, which dates itself from 1662. Later, I'll tell you more about how it got there. By the way, the readings for today are from Deuteronomy. 
you can see it there, um, D-E-U-T-5, um, and concerns Moses receiving the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai. So as well as Edward's feast, it's a big day in the biblical sense. So young, young King Edward was described by the um, historian uh, David Rollison as the best known and best documented example of a murdered royal saint and added that his claim to sainthood rest, <laughs> rested almost solely on the circumstances of his death. This makes him rather special because even his first biographer or what we would call a hagiographer makes out that he was an obnoxious brat rather than the saintly youth portrayed in this statue, which is in St. Uh, St. Edward the Martyr Roman Catholic Church in Shaftesbury. So in my presentation, I'll introduce you to Edward and his untimely death. We will look at how and when he was sanctified and how and why his saintly cult continued for centuries. Jumping ahead nearly 600 years, I'll consider how this late Anglo-Saxon royal saint was included in the Book of Common Prayer when so many other English saints were jettisoned in the turbulent mid-Tudor period. Then we'll look at a modern twist to Edward's story, his revival in a most unlikely place, and the ultimate mystery of this young saint. Edward's father, sorry, Edward's father was Edgar, known somewhat ambiguously as either the peaceful or the peaceable. Based in Winchester, Edgar consolidated political unity across England and aggressively led monastic reform, especially at Winchester. It was during his reign that St. Swithin was sanctified in 971. Now to support these new monastic foundations that he'd established, Edgar took land from the nobles and allocated it and the income from the land to abbeys and nunneries. As you can imagine, many nobles were displeased. Edgar died quite young at the age of 32, leaving two sons who were potential successors. Edward was the son of Edward, 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 sorry, Edward was the son of Edgar's first wife, Ethelfled, whom he married before he became king. The other contender was Ethelred, the son of Edgar's second or third wife, Elgiver, who had been consecrated as his queen. So our Edward became king in 975 when he was aged 13 or 14 in this hotly contested succession in which Elgiver, supported by leading nobles, promoted the 10-year-old Ethelred uh, in his place. In the first year of his short reign, there was a virtual civil war as nobles sought to reclaim land they had lost to the monks. Now, let me get to the story of the central event of this mystery. It was springtime on the 18th of March, 978 in Dorset. A young man, aged 16 or 17, or 18, had been hunting on horseback with friends, but left them to visit his stepmother and stepbrother at the nearby town of Corf. As he rode up to their house, a man or men stabbed him in the side as he was taking a welcome drink while seated in the saddle. According to one account, the horse took fright, galloped away with the dying rider hanging from his saddle. The young man, who we know as Edward, King of the West Saxons, was buried in secret, or at least in an unrecorded grave, and without any royal honours, according to his first hagiographer. These were quite extraordinary circumstances. First, a king is murdered, and second, he's buried in secret. And I'll just digress for a moment, because when a king wasn't sort of prima inter pares, the first among equals. The king was consecrated and it was seen as a sacred role. He was closer to God 
than his, than his uh, people. Edgar's successor, his half-brother Ethelred, was crowned quickly at Kingston, but no one, not nobles, bishops, friends, or close family, cared enough to find Edward's body and provide a proper burial. As well, no one was arrested for his murder and there seemed little interest. Sure, we can agree with the eminent historian Sir Frank Stenton, that, who said that Edward was murdered, and I quote, under circumstances of abominable treachery. And as I said before, these were extraordinary circumstances for an English king. However, a year later, a body was exhumed from the unrecorded grave and translated or taken to St. Mary's Church in nearby Wareham. The body was found to be incorrupt. That means it had not decayed. It was as if it was resting, which is a sign of great sanctity. Was it Edward? Now, as you can see from the coloured text, which comes from the Peterborough or the E version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and there were six versions of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and, and is dated to 978 or 979. It says, the murder of the young king was deeply upsetting, and I'll read, no worse deed for the English race was done than this. <clears throat> Men murdered him, but God exalted him. In life, he was an earthly king, and after death, he's now a heavenly saint, and so on. However, in 979, when this was supposedly written, Edward was still buried in that modest grave somewhere between Corfe and Wareham. So we must assume that the entry for these years was written some years later when his sanctification was being widely promoted. Other versions of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, however, reported the incident much less elaborately. Our local Winchester version prosaically records for 978, and I quote, here, King Edward was killed, full stop. In the same year, his brother, the Atheling, or the Prince, Ethelred, succeeded to the kingdom. So we could see no words were wasted in Winchester. So why was Edward killed? The reasons have been widely discussed, and I'll, I'll share some of them with you. David Farmer, a historian, says his assassination was connected with a, con a struggle for power among the magnates, the, the great lords. There had been a civil war in the first year of his reign, with a famine in the following year. These were really hard times. The magnates uh, dissolved the monasteries, drove the monks away and reclaimed recently, land recently taken by Edgar. Over, quote, over and again, widows were robbed, says the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for 975. The countryside was violent. Again, I turn to David Farmer, who commented that the anti-monastic party in Mercia, which is essentially what we would now call the Midlands, wanted Edward's half-brother, Ethelred, who was even younger than Edward as king. Elgiver, who was Edgar's wife, who had been consecrated as his queen, wanted her son on the throne too. She and her supporters argued that Edward was not the true heir to his father, Edgar, because his mother had not been consecrated as the queen. And I think, and you think your family has problems. Obviously, there was much bitterness and revenge in the aftermath of Edgar the supposedly peaceful reign. Now, at this point, you probably may well be thinking, what's this story got to do with Winchester? It's a fair question. And the answer is linked to Bishop Ethelwald of Winchester, who was a close advisor to King Edgar and a proponent of monastic reform, along with Archbishop Dunstan of Canterbury and Bishop Oswald of Worcester. All three would later be canonized or sanctified as confessor saints. However, Ethelwald fell out with Dunstan and Oswald over the succession to Edgar. They backed Edward, they had the, these two had backed Edward, the son 
of Edgar's first wife, while the Winchester Bishop was in the camp of Elgiver, who was Edgar's second or third wife, according to whether Edgar actually married a woman called Wolfthrith or not, who was between the first and second wife or the first and third wife, depending on the way we work this out. She was the mother of Edgar's daughter, Edith, who also became an important royal saint at Wilton. Ethelwald promoted the candidacy of Ethelred and remained an advisor to the young king until his own death in 984, while Elgiver acted as the de facto regent. So let's return to Ed, the story of Edgar's post-death progress. I turn again to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which simply states that, quote, here in this year, which was 980, the Ealdorman or Earl Elphir fetched the Holy King's body and carried it with great honor to Shaftesbury. Now this may have been penance for Elphir who had led the anti-monastic Mercians who had opposed Edgar's, Edgar's, Edward's succession. And John Crook, whom many of us know, has noted that in the 12th century, the historian William of Malmesbury wrote that Edward's grave was illuminated by a miraculous light from heaven and miracles of healing occurred. So it's a journey of about 30 miles from Wareham, north to Shaftesbury Abbey, which was founded by King Alfred in 888. The Abbey was of the highest royal status and would be the resting place of Edward's relics until the disillusion in the late 1530s. Shaftesbury was known for much of the medieval period as Edward Stowe, the holy place of Edward. Edward's shrine, which was on an important pilgrim route, was responsible for much of the prosperity of the abbey and the town. Within a decade of his death, miracles were being recorded at Edward's shrine. And in two decades, the veneration of Edward had turned into a cult as a result of political and popular acclamation. Around 997, which is about 20 years after his death, his first biographer or hagiographer, Bert of Ramsey wrote that, quote, so many miracles took place at his tomb that no one could write them down as quickly as they were taking place. Now, how do we know the story of Edward's life, death, and sanctification? Apart from records such as charters and laws, there were two publications in the century after his death, which were of importance and are still available. The first was published around 20 years after the murder. And this is, it is Bertford's Lives of Saints Oswald and Equine. And you may ask, where does Edward fit into this? It's a very, it's a rambling document, which in, tells of Edward's murder, the translation to Shaftesbury and his emerging cult over several pages, which is sort of wedged in to the section around uh, St. Oswald. Even Burtforth self-critically says his, tack, his text is, quote, lacking in snow white clarity. And I think that is an understatement. The consensus is that Edward, whom Bertfirth says verbally abused and beat people in his household, uh, is included in the life of St. Oswald as a deliberate attempt to promote the cult and increase the number of saintly relatives supporting Ethelred at a time of increasing Viking attacks. As well, Bishop and now St. Oswald had been a supporter of Edward's candidature to replace Edgar in 975. Now the second text, which isn't illustrated here, is attributed to Gosselin of Canterbury, and it's a passion, and its Latin title is on the screen, Passio Sancti Edwardi Regis et Martyrs, the Passion of Saint Edward, King and Martyr. It's, it's a passion is an account of a martyrdom, and it is, it is written to the, place the martyr in, in similar circumstances to the life of Christ. It was written in the 1070s and so indicates that the Normans 
were supportive of the saint's cult. The manuscript would not have been allowed without their agreement. It also touches on an aspect of the murder story, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Now, many stories have the device of a wicked stepmother, Cinderella, Snow White, Hansel and Gretel, I'm sure you can add lots of others. And there's no doubt that Elgiver was very ambitious with her, for her son, Ethelred. And it's highly likely that Edward's assassins were associated with her as the murder took place when Edward came to visit her and Ethelred at court. Whether she was a willing party to the attack is not known. However, it was a century before she was blamed for the murder within Gosselin of Canterbury's Passion. The historian William of Malmesbury embellished the claim in the 12th century by painting her as the wicked stepmother who arranged or encouraged her stepson's murder to benefit her son and the anti-monastic Mercian party. This narrative was continued by other writers throughout the Middle Ages. Later, according to William of Malmesbury, Elgiva expiated her crime by eventually becoming a nun at world. However, it was common for wealthy widows to enter a nunnery and Elgiva had established religious houses at Amesbury and Werwell. We can, however, appreciate that Elgiva was a canny survivor who lived for around 20 years after Ethelred came to the throne, thus assisting his reign as one of the longest, if not the most successful of the Anglo-Saxon era. Now, turning to the cult's popularity, this illustration on, on the slide here is of a silver penny coin with a portrait of the teenaged King Edward. It was unearthed in 2018 on the Isle of Wight by a metal detectorist and sold uh, last year uh, in April for 8,000 pounds plus commission. It is one of at least 15 Edward the Martyr coins sold in the past decade. And around the portrait is the legend, Edward, King of the English. The coin was struck by a mania in Canterbury and shows how quickly commerce swung into action when there was a new king on the throne. After Edward was murdered, his saintly cult developed quickly. Just after, just over 20 years later in 1001, his half-brother Ethelred referred to him as a saint and martyr in a charter which granted land to Shaftesbury Abbey. In 1008, his feast day of March the 18th was declared as a national festival by Ethelred and his royal council. It was to be observed all across England. And this was undoubtedly official backing to the cult of the royal martyr saint. Edward's cult was taken up by Ethelred's Danish successor, Canute, and sustained as a royal cult by the remaining Anglo-Danish and Anglo-Saxon kings. The feast day of March the 18th also appeared quickly in Anglo-Saxon calendars of religious feasts. So let's turn to the Normans, because from 1066 and the Norman invasion and onwards, through the Anglo-Norman period, the cults of many Anglo-Saxon saints were swept aside, with only some returning in the early Plantagenet period. Landfrank, the first Norman Archbishop of Canterbury, who is pictured here, doubted the validity of many English saints. In their place, he introduced what we call universal saints, feast days for universal saints. These were the apostles, early patriarchs of the church and early martyrs who were venerated widely in Western Europe. Several Norman saints were added to calendars and litten. However, some English royal saints cults were supported, notably Edmund of East Anglia and our Edward, King and Martyr. In the case of Edward, the Normans claimed that he was part of a line of descent that connected with Edward the Confessor, whose mother was the Norman, uh, the Norman woman, Emma, who was the second wife of both Ethelred and of Canute. Thus, the sainted Edward, King and Martyr, 
help legitimize Norman rule. The recognition also sustained his cult through the Norman and Anglo-Norman period, while others, when others were dismissed. During the long medieval period, Edward's importance declined, but he was supported by some monarchs. In particular, Henry III was notably interested in him in the 13th century. Perhaps the greatest long-term Philip to Edward's cult was the inclusion of his life or his vita in the golden legend or the Aurea Legendia, which was the most widely copied book of saints' lives in the Middle Ages. And there are still some 800 manuscripts of it in existence. Prepared by an Italian monk bishop, Jacobus de Voragine, and first appearing around 1260, it had many editions and was one of the first books printed around 200 years later. It was a category of a book called a legendary. Edward's story was also carried in the South English legendary, a page of which illustrates the slide to the left. It was written in Middle English as was one of several legendaries that circulated in England. So as well as the Anglo-Norman William of Malmesbury's histories, Edward was mentioned in chronicles such as those of Florence of Worcester, Henry of Huntingdon, Walter Mapp, Gamar, and John of Worcester, all illustrating that even though he was not at the prime rank of English saints, um, he was certainly mentioned over a long period. In addition to inclusion in these legendaries and chronicles, there are many other methods by which the popularity of an endurance of Edward's cult can be measured. There are 26 calendars, and they are spelt with a K, of saints festivals from the Anglo-Saxon period in existence. And Edward's feast on 18th of March is on 19 of them. Thus, show, thus the calendars show his cult was immediately popular. His inclusion in the litany in which the saint, a list of saints is prayed to, prayed to, numbers 15 in the Anglo-Saxon period, but dropped away in the Middle Ages. He was not big among ancient church dedications either, numbering only five, but in the medieval era, his feast day was included in an increasing number of secular calendars, including the Black Book of the Exchequer and the Golden Legend, as well as the, cal uh, the calendar of festivals listed in the Serum Missal, which I'll discuss shortly. However, St. George took over. And we all know about St. George, we all have an image of him. Edward receded from national celebration. He wasn't completely ignored with Richard II showing a devotion to a fellow former monarch, but as the Wilt Wilton diptych shows, Edward the Martyr wasn't included, and he was secondary to Edward, Edmund the Martyr, the East Anglian, and Edward the Confessor, who were pictured. Over time, these national saints, Edmund, Edward, and Edward the Confessor, were overtaken by the very legendary uh, St. George. They were quite simply not martial enough for the Plantagenets, and none had a reputation of winners in war. The aggressive George took their places and he is now commemorated as our national saint. However, Edward was included in the liturgy and litany of the Serum Missal, which, as its name indicates, came from Salisbury. Professor Nigel Morgan, the foremost expert on the Serum Missal, contends that the cult of Edward, whom he calls a relatively minor saint of the Salisbury Diocese, only survived into the late medieval period, that is the 15th century and the early 16th century, because he was included in the Serum calendar and Sanctorum. Now, the use of Serum and its missal, the Book of, of Masses, gradually became the standard form of mass most widely used in the English church. And so its family of saints thus became the nation's saints. And Edward continued. Now, moving ahead to the Reformation, the reforming Thomas Cranmer, pictured here, 
who became Archbishop of Canterbury in 1533, cleared away all saints' days other than those of the apostles and early church fathers and replaced the Serum Missal with the first version of the Book of Common Prayer, which was published in 1549. Edward King and Martyr was left out of this edition and was slightly revised 1551 edition. However, just over a decade later, in the first edition of the Queen Elizabeth's reign, Edward returned to a slimmer calendar of saints' feasts and was confirmed in the 1662 edition version, which is essentially the Book of Common Prayer that we use today. So Edward was back in favour after a very brief interlude and was still with us. So what is the modern twist in the mystery of Edward's death and translation to Shaftesbury? It's a real Inspector Barnaby special. As you can see from this photo, there is what appears to be a lead covered box on display at the Abbey Museum in Shaftesbury. In 1931, this box was unearthed and found to contain male human bones. And so speculation arose that these might be the relics of Edward that had been missing since the dissolution of and destruction of the Abbey in 1539. Now controversially, in the 1960s, the bones were attributed to Edward by Thomas Stoll, a doctor. And since 1984, they've been enshrined in a Russian Orthodox Church in Exile chapel at Brookwood Cemetery in Surrey, where the St. Edward Brotherhood cares for them. And when lockdown lifts, you may be able to visit the shrine, although most historians and osteoarchaeologists seriously doubt they are Edward's relics. For those who'd like to get closer to the tale of Edward's murder and the translation of his incorrupt body to Shaftesbury, you'll be able to walk a 30 mile long route from Wareham northward to the Abbey ruins in Shaftesbury. Called the St Edward's Way, it was due to be launched last year, but for obvious reasons was postponed until some time this year. However, it seems that the route has already been waymarked with red arrows that contain an image of the youthful king and I hope to walk it with Jenny later in spring. So in this murder mystery, there is a final mystery. Was it Edward's body that was translated from Wareham to Shaftesbury? This was the question that was raised by Barbara York in her 1999 article. The question turns on a sermon known as the Sermon of the Wolf or Sermo Lupi, given by Wolfstan, the Archbishop of York in 1014. Wolfstan berated the English for killing the young king and bringing God's wrath upon themselves. This he said had resulted in Viking invasions, famines and social instability. In the sermon, which he gave in many places over several years, Wolfstan said Edward's body had been burnt after the murder. As an archbishop, you'd expect that he had his facts right. Professor York asked whether the body was that of an unknown Anglo-Saxon youth, which was acquired, quote, so Edward could be buried with appropriate ceremonials and perhaps appear incorrupt as a demonstration of sainthood. Like most mysteries, we may never know the answer. It could be the ultimate cold case to review. So thank you for joining this talk and for giving your support to the friends. For those who have endured wet summer holidays, perhaps you'll recall this playing card of Edward the Martyr from the Kings and Queens card game. This is from our pack at home which is why it's a bit ragged at the edges. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And if there's time, I'm happy to take questions or discuss the cases yes. I've made. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, Tom, that was amazing. I mean, who would have thought <laughs> such a, 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 um, a young man in such a short span, if you see what I mean, would, would have this sort of legacy across, across the, you know, the decades, the ages, the years, the millennia almost. Um, I, you've made a fantastic story, really, out of, you know, of, of interest <laughs> and dastardly deed and, and all the sort of uh, shenanigans that seem to go on <laughs> in every generation, don't they, <laughs> in one way or another, whether it's royalty, barons or governments these days. Um, and also, isn't it interesting that, you know, as a saint, you could be, or as a dead person, you could be in or out of favour, just like you can in your own life, if you see what I mean. You, you've covered so many different aspects of, of um, history and people and all the stuff that sort of goes on in, in, in really everyday life. I don't think anything changes that much in funny sort of way, except perhaps we don't, well, we still make saints quite readily, don't we, actually, in some ways. Um, or the world does, um, but you know. Anyway, Tom, it was absolutely brilliant. I really fascinating. I didn't think I didn't expect to be so intrigued by <laughs> by such a <laughs> such a little person, as it were. <laughs> Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalie. Um, now, there's a few, um, a couple of questions for you, Tom. Um, but one from Joanna Strong um, questions, why do you think it took until 1559 for him to be put back into the calendar after he was removed from the litany in 1538? Um, Joanna's asking, why wouldn't Edward VI have put him back during um, the Protestantization of England? Well, I, um, I think there's a misunderstanding on timing. He was omitted in 1549. He was dropped in 1549 from the Book of Common Prayer, which was in Edward VI's period. And the second edition of the Book of Common Prayer was 1551, also in Edward's uh, period. Um, but he was brought back um, into the Book of Common Prayer on a much reduced list of saints um, in, after Edward died and Elizabeth came to the throne. Um, I could spend an almost equal amount of time talking about the shenanigans of the Book of Common Prayer in the mid Tudor period, but um, it's a different it's a different story. Now, I think I think Johanna's slightly mis misunderstood my dates. And, and she also had a follow up question yep. about um, about asking if Elizabeth replaced him um, to appease the Catholic or more Catholic leaning English people. What's your view on that, Tom? There, there is an element of that, um, even, even though the, the top line story about the Book of Common Prayer's first editions uh, was very, very reforming, very, very Protestant, there was a, a considerable amount of um, um, slippage that went on beneath, below, below ground level, if you like. There was a lot of, um, uh, there was a big argument that went on that the, the entire law community uh, organized its calendar around saints days and that if you abolished all the saints days it would create mayhem with the law terms and the dates within them and so the the legal profession was allowed to keep the day the saints many of the saints days in their calendars um, when elizabeth came back there was an element of um rowing back on the the strong Protestantism of Edward, but not completely back to a, uh, a full, full, if you like, a sort of full flavor Catholic model. Um, it, there was a sort of a blend that uh, that, that um, Elizabeth and her her archbishops uh, put together. Thank you, Tom. Um, another question about. Um, the visit to his stepmother, um, sort of saying that would he have not been, had protection if when he was going to visit his stepmother, he was the king, would he have had, should he have had henchmen with him to prevent what happens happening to him? What's your view on that? The, there, are, there, is, there, are, there are a couple of versions of the story. Um, and one of them has him um, farewelling his friends and riding over to Corfe to see his stepmother um, and his half-brother um, by himself. Um, 
the another one has him coming with a small retinue, but I don't think he he it wasn't as if he was travelling with um, the special branch you know, alongside him, clearing the way, you know, making sure that no one got near him. These was this was a small kingdom. It was it was a family visit, um, and uh, if those who anyway those who came with him. Um, um, were no deterrent to the to the attackers. He was attacked, and the the, the two main stories that are told uh, say that he was seated on his horse, drinking the equivalent of I guess what you would call a stirrup cup or sort of a glass of wel something welcome after a day's hunting, and he was he was attacked while he was seated on his horse. Um, so that's the story. Whether he was by himself or with a small retinue, it wasn't a security, set, uh, it wasn't a secure me mode of travel. He wasn't surrounded by um, secret service agents like an American American president. Thank you. Um, another question about, um, in terms of the, the kind of major reason why he was, for his sainthood, is it because that when his body was, the fact that his body was allegedly incorrupt when it was dug up, or is it to do with him being murdered at a young age? Which which element of the story contributed to sainthood the most? Well, the, um, the there, if if you look at, across the Anglo-Saxon period, there were several royal saints um, created up to about the end of. Uh, about the beginning of the ninth century. Then there was a bit of a gap. And then um, we had uh, Edward Edmund of East Anglia um, uh, killed by the Vikings um, in the ninth century. Um, and then Ed, Edward killed in the 10th century. So um, there was a sort of, there was almost a, so there was a gap to fill of, of royal saints. Um, and there, there were attempts, for example, to have Alfred uh, sanctified, but they never really made great pro. It never really made great progress. Um, the the reason I think, like a lot of things, it's the context of this. Um, I think there was a realization that the murder of Edward was a terrible mistake. Uh, it's you know they didn't. He he was not a nice young man, but that was no reason to murder him. Um, and uh, it was interesting that the um, leader of the Mercians was the man who took his, his supposedly incorrupt body from Wareham to Shaftesbury. And so I think there was an element of reconciliation that was being attempted quite quickly. Um, the, within the story of um, the miracles of Edward, we have the, the sta almost standard line that um, there were so many miracles that no one could record them. Uh, and if you look at the Michael Lappage's um, book on uh, translation of the um, hagiography of Swithin, we had exactly the same story that so many pilgrims were coming and casting their, casting their um, uh, you know, being able to stand and throwing away their sticks uh, that no one could count them. And the monks were actually annoyed by being woken in the night for yet another miracle happening. Um, so there's an element of standard language that comes into it, but there's no doubt that I th that saints at this time were there were political reasons for sanctification, but there are also popular reasons that people believed great wrong had been done, and that Edward should be commemorated. Um, and he, uh, while he was not a not remotely a, a typical saintly martyr in the way of the early martyrs of the church, um, there was enough popular belief in him. Um, and I think it's Robert Bartlett says that miracles tend to happen where people expect miracles to happen. And I think there was a belief that Edward should be sanctified and there was a popular support for it. So it's a very long answer, but uh, it's not a simple A or B type of reason. I think your answer is quite interesting. There's another question about what uh, what was the process by which he and others became saints at the time. Say it's not very credible, and I think actually what you've just um, summarised there shows that it wasn't a an exact process. Um, it, it wasn't until the 12th century that Rome really took 
hold of, of um, canonization. Uh, what we had at these times was popular, popular sanctification. Um, and um, sometimes it, the, the cult took off, other times it didn't. But it was notable that each of the three uh, bishops who supported monastic reform, Dunstan, Ethelwald, and Oswald were all, were all sanctified very quickly after their deaths. And I, it was almost, if you look at Ethelwald's late part of his life, he was setting himself up to become a cult, saintly cult after his death. And he, it struggled on for quite a while, but eventually faded away. Thank you. Right, I think we'll just have one final question before we finish. Um, there's a question from, um, from Liz Wald saying that she had read somewhere that the supposed bones um, were studied and they had wounds that were consistent with the um, accounts of Edward's murder. Just wondering if you can comment on that, Tom. The osteoarchaeologists argue that the, the damage to the bones would have happened after death rather than in terms of the time of his death. Um, and um, this is where the doubt comes into it, that, that Thomas Stowell was, was a doctor author. In fact, just at the, <laughs> those of a certain memory might remember that Stowell proposed that the Duke, of, was it the Duke of Clarence, I think, one of Queen Victoria's sons was actually Jack the Ripper. Um, and then, uh, Stowell, I think, published the book and died the next week, unfortunately. Uh, Stowell was, um, was a, well, he called himself, well, he was regarded as a bone doctor, but osteoarchaeologists believe that the damage to the bones happened, that the ones found at Shaftesbury, uh, the damage was uh, post-mortem rather than during the, during possibly an attack on him or even beforehand. That, that's the, that is where the doubt comes into what is in Shaftesbury. And if I could just continue quickly, um, the reason they ended up after 50 years in a Russian Orthodox chapel, which is, it's called, I think it's called, you know, the St. Edward King and Martyr Chapel at Brookwood Cemetery, is because the Russian Orthodox church in exile accepted the owner's demand that they be regarded as the true relics of Edward, whereas most, the rest of the church did not accept that. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, now again, if anybody does have any other questions, please let me know afterwards and we can get them answered for you. Um, thank you very much um, to all of you who've joined this mm. evening. Um, thank you very much to those of you who've made a donation. Um, I will send um, an email out with the link again afterwards. And, and if any of you um, have got friends who might be interested in this talk, um, please let me know and I can send you a link to send the recording to them. Uh, we've got a couple of more events um, in March. We've got our coffee morning this morning um, tomorrow morning um, at 10.30, which is um, a, a small group of us, but it's always fun because some people always discover some connection between somebody and we, we break out into breakout groups. So do let me know if you want to join. And then we've got a talk um, on Monday, the 29th of March um, by Patrick Daniel about Ethiopia. Um, I know that lots of you have signed up for that um, and... But I, have, but I will just send the link out to everyone who has come to kind of one, one or more of these talks. I'll just send it out to you. Um, please feel free to join us for that. Um, and I think, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you again for supporting us and being here this evening. And can we unmute ourselves, Lucy, and say thank you very much indeed and clap. Thank you very much. Yes. Excellent thank talk. You. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Very good. Tom, we can see your we can see your inbox, Tom. <laughs> 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 On the share screen. <laughs>